Chapter 7, Child Raising on Mars, After a Breakfast, which was an exact replica of the meal of the preceding day and an index of practically every meal which followed, while I was with the Green Men of Mars, so they escorted me to the plaza, where I found the entire community engaged in watching or helping at the harnessing of huge Mastodonian animals to great three-wheeled chariots. There were about 250 of these vehicles, each drawn by a single animal, any one of which, from their appearance, might easily have drawn the entire wagon train when fully loaded. The chariots themselves were large, commodious, and gorgeously decorated. In each was seated a female Martian loaded with all ornaments of metal, with jewels and silks and furs, and upon the back of each of the beasts, which drew the chariots was perched a young Martian driver. Like the animals upon which the warriors were mounted, the heavier draft animals wore neither bid nor bridle, but were guided entirely by telepathic means. This power is wonderfully developed in all Martians, and accounts largely for the simplicity of their language and the relatively few spoken words exchanged even in long conversations. It is the universal language of Mars, through the medium of which the higher, and lower animals of this world the paradoxes are able to communicate to a greater or less extent, depending upon the intellectual sphere of the species and the development of the individual. As the cavalcade took up the line of march in single file, Sola dragged me into an empty chariot and we proceeded with the procession toward the point, by which I had entered the city the day before. At the head of the caravan rode some 200 warriors, five abreast, and a like number brought up the rear, while 25 or 30 outriders flanked us on either side. Everyone but myself men, women, and children were heavily armed, and at the tail of each chariot trotted a Martian hound, my own beast following closely behind ours, in fact, the faithful creature never left me voluntarily during the entire ten years I spent on Mars. Our way led out across the little valley before the city, through the hills, and down into the Dead Sea bottom, which I had traversed on my journey from the incubator to the plaza. The incubator, as it proved, was the terminal point of our journey this day, and, as the entire cavalcade broke into a mad gallop, as soon as we reached the level expanse of sea bottom, we were soon within sight of our goal. On reaching it the chariots were parked with military precision on the four sides of the enclosure, and half a score of warriors, headed by the enormous chieftain, and including Tars Tarkas and several other lesser chiefs, dismounted and advanced toward it. I could see Tars Tarkas explaining something to the principal chieftain, whose name, by the way, was, as nearly as I can translate it into English, Lurkwaz Tamil, Jed, Jed being his title. I was soon appraised of the subject of their conversation, as, calling to Sola, Tars Tarkas signed for her to send me to him. I had by this time mastered the intricacies of walking under Martian conditions, and quickly responding to his command I advanced to the side of the incubator where the warriors stood. As I reached their side a glance showed me that all but a very few eggs had hatched, the incubator being fairly alive with the hideous little devils. They ranged in height from three to four feet, and were moving restlessly about the enclosure, as though searching for food. As I came to a halt before him, Tars Tarkas pointed over the incubator and said, Sack. I saw that he wanted me, to repeat my performance of yesterday for the edification of Lurkwaz Tamil, and, as I must confess that my prowess gave me no little satisfaction, I responded quickly, leaping entirely over the parked chariots on the far side of the incubator. As I returned, Lurkwaz Tamil grunted something at me, and turning to his warriors gave a few words of command relative to the incubator. They paid no further attention to me and I was thus permitted to remain close and watch their operations, which consisted in breaking an opening in the wall of the incubator large enough to permit of the exit of the young Martians. On either side of this opening the women and the younger Martians, both male and female, formed two solid walls leading out through the chariots and quite away into the plain beyond. Between those walls the little Martians scampered, wild as deer, 
being permitted to run the full length of the aisle, where they were captured one at a time by the women and older children, the last in the line capturing the first little one, to reach the end of the gauntlet, her opposite in the line capturing the second, and so on until all the little fellows had left the enclosure, and been appropriated by some youth or female. As the women caught the young they fell out of line and returned to their respective chariots, while those who fell into the hands of the young men were later turned over to some of the women. I saw that the ceremony, if it could be dignified by such a name, was over, and seeking out Sola I found her in our chariot with a hideous little creature held tightly in her arms. The work of rearing young, green Martians consists solely in teaching them to talk, and to use the weapons of warfare, with which they are loaded down from the very first year of their lives. Coming from eggs, in which they have lain for five years, the period of incubation, they step forth into the world perfectly developed except in size. Entirely unknown to their mothers, who, in turn, would have difficulty in pointing out the fathers with any degree of accuracy, they are the common children of the community, and their education devolves upon the females, who chance to capture them as they leave the incubator. Their foster mothers may not even have had an egg in the incubator, as was the case with Sola, who had not commenced to lay, until less than a year, before she became the mother of another woman's offspring. But this counts for little among their green Martians, as parental and filial love is as unknown to them as it is common among us. I believe this horrible system, which has been carried on for ages is the direct cause of the loss of all the finer feelings and higher humanitarian instincts among these poor creatures. From birth they know no father or mother love, they know not the meaning of the word home, they are taught that they are only suffered to live until they can demonstrate by their physique and ferocity, that they are fit to live. Should they prove deformed, or defective in any way they are promptly shot, nor do they see a tear shed for a single one of the many cruel hardships they pass through from earliest infancy. I do not mean that the adult Martians are unnecessarily or intentionally cruel to the young, but theirs is a hard and pitiless struggle for existence upon a dying planet, the natural resources of which have dwindled to a point, where the support of each additional life means an added tax upon the community into which it is thrown. By careful selection they rear only the hardiest specimens of each species, and with almost supernatural foresight they regulate the birth rate to merely offset the loss by death. Each adult Martian female brings forth about 13 eggs each year, and those which meet the size, weight, and specific gravity tests are hidden in the recesses of some subterranean vault, where the temperature is too low for incubation. Every year these eggs are carefully examined by a council of 20 chieftains, and all but about 100 of the most perfect are destroyed out of each yearly supply. At the end of five years about 500 almost perfect eggs have been chosen from the thousands brought forth. These are then placed in the almost airtight incubators, to be hatched by the sun's rays after a period of another five years. The hatching, which we had witnessed today was a fairly representative event of its kind, all but about 1% of the eggs hatching in two days. If the remaining eggs ever hatched we knew nothing of the fate of the little Martians. They were not wanted, as their offspring might inherit and transmit the tendency to prolonged incubation, and thus upset the system, which has maintained for ages and which permits the adult Martians, to figure the proper time for return to the incubators, almost to an hour. The incubators are built in remote fastnesses, where there is little or no likelihood of their being discovered by other tribes. The result of such a catastrophe would mean no children in the community for another five years. I was later to witness the results of the discovery of an alien incubator. The community of which the Green Martians, with whom my lot was cast formed apart was composed of some 30,000 souls. They roamed an enormous tract of arid and semi-arid land between 40 and 80 degrees south latitude, and bounded on the east and west by two large fertile tracts. Their headquarters lay in the southwest corner of this district, near the crossing of two of the so-called Martian canals. 
as the incubator had been placed far north of their own territory in a supposedly uninhabited and unfrequented area, we had before us a tremendous journey, concerning which I, of course, knew nothing. After our return to the dead city I passed several days in comparative idleness. On the day following our return all the warriors had ridden forth early in the morning, and had not returned until just before darkness fell. As I later learned, they had been to the subterranean vaults, in which the eggs were kept, and had transported them to the incubator, which they had then walled up for another five years, and which, in all probability, would not be visited again during that period. The vaults which hid the eggs until they were ready for the incubator were located many miles south of the incubator, and would be visited yearly by the council of twenty chieftains. Why they did not arrange to build their vaults and incubators nearer home has always been a mystery to me, and, like many other Martian mysteries, unsolved and unsolvable by earthly reasoning and customs. Sola's duties were now doubled, as she was compelled to care for the young Martian as well as for me, but neither one of us required much attention, and as we were both about equally advanced in Martian education, Sola took it upon herself to train us together. Her prize consisted in a male about four feet tall, very strong and physically perfect. Also, he learned quickly, and we had considerable amusement, at least I did, over the keen rivalry we displayed. The Martian language, as I have said, is extremely simple, and in a week I could make all my wants known, and understand nearly everything that was said to me. Likewise, under Sola's tutelage, I developed my telepathic powers, so that I shortly could sense practically everything that went on around me. What surprised Sola most in me was, that while I could catch telepathic messages easily from others, and often when they were not intended for me, no one could read a jot from my mind under any circumstances. At first this vexed me, but later I was very glad of it as it gave me an undoubted advantage over the Martians.